Pillar of Eternity continues. Welcome back, everyone, to video five. We're going to go ahead and leave the, the crypt here just for now. I kind of like to finish exploring one area at a time, and I'd like to do the overworld here in the town. Besides that, there may be quests that involve going down in there. Are you a giant? More or less. I saw someone go into the temple. Papa says we're not supposed to. Alright, that's all the kids got to say. Looks like we have a uh, another godlike here. A moonhead. Feld Felion. You see a pennant waving tall and sluggish in the wind, a rising sun embroidered on the banner, the vanguard of a small troop of paladins. The atmosphere is buoyant, if restrained, and their armor has not yet been tarnished by the elements. This expedition is fresh, young, filled with zest and zeal. At their head stands a commander, awkward in full armor, but determined and stepped. Despite the excitement of his fellows, he does not smile. There's a twist to his mouth. His countenance is grim. He throws up a hand, halting his troop. Silence falls among them, revealing a dark thunder deep and low. He orders them to ready their weapons and spread out. Eyes dart from horizon to horizon, necks twisting to see the sources of the sound. In the distance, dust and lightning rise from the ground. A stingy and clouds race toward them overhead. The soldiers stand. Only the staccato movement of their breath betraying their nerves. The commander closes his eyes, calling a blessing down on his troop. Invigorated, invincible they wait, as the enemy draws closer, poised to attack. This guy's a kick-ass commander fighter dude. And again, you can't do any kind of interaction beyond kind of seeing into their souls. It's cool, I guess it's a way that... Uh, I mean, as someone that hasn't played the game, I'm assuming this is a way to kind of give a little bit more background and history to the different characters of locations instead of just saying they're all villagers or they all just have the little quick blur bubbles that pop up. It kind of gives more depth to the game, which is really cool. Whether or not we end up getting quests or being able to talk to these people later more, I'm not sure. I'm not... I don't know what exactly the whole soul thing signifies because we have people like that and then we have just straight up villagers and child children and stuff running around where you're not getting any kind of interaction except a little blurb bubble. Uh, but anyways. I forget what this was. Let me just look at this again. Beneath the vines are crude carvings of a sun rising over three stars. And we can't do much of, much more than that. Don't think we can go into every house. Used to have a lot more fortune tellers come through, but Radric has chased us. Had us chase him off. Well. Okay, we can go to Magrin's Fork or back to the Veilwood. We get to Silent Lys. Can't get to Cade Noir or the Madam the Madam Bridge. Ronan and Hugo and Villager. 
Oh, I said I was going to switch out my animals, so let's do that. Now we have our cool little bloodhound following us around. Despite the rains, the stalks feel as dry and stiff as a locust husk. You keep your distance. I don't want any trouble. Fine then, lady. I'll just steal your bush. <laughs> I had a feeling there was going to be souls. You see a group of people standing around a wagon, transfixed on a sword as it swings in a large, graceful arc. The man holds the sword, passing it from hand to hand with relaxed ease, making the blade dance in front of his audience. He tosses it in the air, spins and puts his arm behind his back to catch it. The crowd claps excitedly, and the couple of them gasp, certain they were about to see a tragedy. You know, I'm starting to get the picture that everybody here in this village can probably kick my ass if they wanted to. If this is all their true past. You see a room bright, warm, and covered in greenery. There isn't a spot in the entire space that doesn't have some kind of plant growing in it. Small germinating seeds are in the corner here, sprawling vines climbing the walls there. Although most of the plants are actually in some kind of container, there are a few that have grown from the dirt floor itself. They're just as lovingly cared for as anything else in the room. This man wanders through the plants, smiling at each and every one, an old pipe clenched between his teeth. Stopping next to one, he touches a leaf, lifting it up to look at the underside, then gently rubs it between his fingers. He takes a small handful of soil it grows in and crushes it with his fingers. Satisfied, he drops the soil back into the pot and continues to the next plant. He, a low, he hums a low cherry tune as he moves amongst the plants, occasionally stopping to sing a few words of something to one of them. Finally, he reaches the door, having visited every plant in the room. He turns back to look at them, a look of serene pleasure on his face. Then he turns back and is gone. He is probably a druid of some sort. He's a tree hugger! This town goes on and on. Looks like we have some door action here. Ah, the smithy! So I'm talking about equipment time. Don't think we want to steal from this guy. But I will take a little look, see? Doesn't really look like he has anything worth stealing or getting in trouble over. Denton and Dole, these swords look ready for the forge. Ah, a wand. They're trying to lure Ron Stock into stealing that wand. I know it's up. Tao Tanu. The Samoa of a man is an impressive build towering above the countertop. His skin is the dusky blue of the deeper oceans, and his thick arms boast corded muscle. Small ears frame a square jaw face coated in smeared soot and arcing back tattoos alike. He's uh, a coastal Amawa. As I am, a, I am an island Amawa. He offers you a broad smile as you approach. Welcome! You're the first face I've seen in quite some time. First new face, what can I do for you? What do you have here? You've come to us at a strange time, I'm afraid. The stock's not what it used to be. But we find weapons and armor to offer yet. All forged right here at the Black Hammer. What happened? We just don't have the supplies. Been expecting the next delivery for near on a week now. Haven't seen a sign of it. Have to expect they were hit by bandits. The road out east is crawling with them. Or my workers ran off with the wagon themselves. Maybe to make some coin. <laughs> ah, if that lot would dare. 
He's right about the bandits. The dire situation in the village like this and the exodus to the cities has created far too many opportunities from scrupulous sorts. Tantanu scratches his jaw thinking, If you happen to be headed that way, maybe you could keep an eye out for a supply wagon, or my shipment at least. They'd be cutting through the black meadow, I expect. Only good road for it. As it is, most of all weapons go to his grace, Lord Rajik. Tao Tanu glances at the nearby guard. And that's as it should be. <laughs> My ass. But it doesn't leave much uh, for outsiders. We just don't have the iron. Where was this wagon traveling from? We send the wagon up to New Helmar with weapons, and it swings around through Logholm and the like to purchase supplies. Shortest route back is through the Black Meadow in the north by the Weighted Wilds. Tautanu shakes his head. Had a trader come through with word they made it to Logholm, but haven't heard of the thing since. I'll find your supplies and probably take some of it for myself. Tautanu nods. Then you have my thanks. Minus the stealing part. You bring those supplies back and I'll have plenty more to offer you. A discount to start? Oh, and if you find my workers, tell them to hurry it up. Or they can take up farming instead. <laughs> hey, I wanted That's to buy good. shit. Of course. You won't find it finer anywhere else. Holy madoli. Okay, just like Baldur's Gate, they like to throw magical items up in the blacksmithy. It's his finer pieces of work. We'll definitely be going over all those. Minor ring of deflection and minor ring of protection. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I don't have anywhere close to the coin to buy this stuff. Jenna's lance. Not actually a proper lance, but rather a pike. The weapon was gifted to an Orlan. Made along with a goat. Wait, what the hell? The gift, the weapon was gifted to an Orlan maid along with the goat by her wizard master, Cabrindo. It was forced to show her the door after a number of episodes of remarkable clumsiness and brash carelessness that had left his grimoire waterlog in his laboratory in ashes. The gifts were all the soft-hearted widow could do to snatch staunch his guilt. Wandering from place to place with her only, with her goat, her pike, and a reputation for negligence that preceded her, her fortunes changed one day when she encountered a pair of soldiers trapped by a group of bandits. Too short to wield the pike properly, she instead climbed atop her goat and spurred it into a fray, leveling the pike like a lance and running one of the bandits through. Frightened and confused by the display and intimidated by Gina's coarse language, the remaining bandits fled and the soldiers' lives were spared. Her actions earned her a commission with the local fort and she served with distinction in cavalry. The original experience had given her such pleasure that she always found a place at the front of any charge. Eventually this took its toll and she went missing after her unit was commanded to charge a group of trolls. It is a unique two-handed pike. <clears throat> 14 to 20 damage, a little bit extra reach. Grazes have converted to hits. That's a nice enchantment. 20% of them. And it adds a constitution. Wouldn't mind having that. The crossbow hold wall. It's an arbalist. Two-handed arbalist, which is just a heavy, big-ass, crank-turning crossbow. Three enchantments. 20% attack speed. Crits can inflict prone. With a crit multiplier and does a nice amount of damage. A masterwork of dwarven craftsmanship, the sturdy arbalest earned its name during the Battle of Marching Mountains, where a dwarven ranger held off a group of ogres bearing down on him and his few remaining comrades. In the ranger's hands, the arbalest proved more than capable of launching bolts through thick ogre hide, holding the evading force at bay just long enough for the reinforcements to arrive. While a victory against the ogres proved short lived, the tale is still one told with great pride around dwarven campfires. And we have some kind of crazy stiletto here. Azari the stiletto. Three enchantments. Grants jolting touch on crits. It's got a three damage reduction bypass, which I'm assuming means it ignores an enemy's damage reduction by three. 
uh, or at least three points of it. Piercing accuracy versus deflection. And it's an interrupt weapon. The faster weapons can cause interrupting, which is pretty big in this game, unfortunately, for Lug Lug. He's got to stick to his Lug Lug weapons. The War of Black Trees brought hardship and suffering to many Glanfavans, but it bore a special tragedy for the Druidic Orders, who were forced not only to endure the deaths of many friends and kin, but also the destruction of the lands they revered above all else. Among these was Azraith, a young Ovate. Deeply troubled by the use of the elements to turn nature against the people of Irglanfath, and wondering if he was seeing the last days of his people, Azraith took to walking the endless stretches of burned-down forest in search of something, anything, that might signal a reason to hope. He found it in an old ironwood tree, thick and gnarled with roots that ran in waves to the ground as though they'd been woven there. It stood as it always had, though singed well up the side of the trunk now, while everything around it had been incinerated by soldiers of Deerwood, leaving a wasteland a thousand acres in every direction. Azareth plucked a single branch from the old tree, making sure to express his profound gratitude. An accomplished organic artificer, Azareth reshaped the branch into a blade that would rival any maid in a forge. He infused it with strength of elements, vowing never again to be at their mercy, and resolving that if the tree could endure, so too could he. In his hands, the blade would find its way into the hearts of many soldiers who stood at the edge of the forest with torches and barrels of pitch, and by the war's end he had saved many forests from a flame. When his years were drawing to a close, Azareth made a final pilgrimage back to the old ironwood tree which still stood, and he laid the knife at its base to be taken up by someone else in need of inspiration in dark times. On his way there, he was pleased to see that beneath the ashes that covered the forest floor, new life had begun to spring. Azareth's stiletto is un unusual as the entire weapon is dark red-brown wood, even the blade. The magic used in its creation hardened and protected the wood, preventing it from chipping or warping. Dark green vines and leaves sprout from it and wrap themselves around the hilt to form the grip. That's pretty solidly tight. <clears throat> nice job, nice job. Probably save all my money for now because I'm stingy. Cape of Withdrawal, plus 15 defense. Okay, while disengaging, that makes sense. A bronze horn figurine. Although tarnished and lusterless, it's remarkable age. The intricate inscriptions and texturing still discernible on the horn's surface, along with the artifact's obvious longevity, suggests an obit object of expert workmanship and it summons an animat maybe some kind of automaton I'm not sure camping supplies the blunting belt damage reduction against piercing and slashing that's pretty nice wouldn't mind one of those Damn, side of my case is rattling. Got to tighten it down. Harlan Orenson. He's got a story to tell. You see a man crouching, surreptitious and alone. A series of untamed shrubs, all that hides him from the vision ahead. His eyes are locked on a deadly mangan. Beautiful and terrible eyes, half-lidded as she hums. A bird with fantastic blue and orange plumage sits on her shoulder, trilling gently, and the man is entranced. Trembling and tentative, he stands, and the tranquility is broken by the bird's startled squawk. The Delagangan half smiles, beckoning with twig like fingers. She does not speak as he approaches, his mouth is dripping sounds of awe and admiration. She waits, coy and tempting, with agonizing slowness, he is before her. Then something changes. She sees something hanging limply from his side and begins to hiss, fingers suddenly claws and eyes black with hate. He has no time to reach for his axe or grimoire as she strikes, and just as soon as she strikes she is gone. The only evidence of her existence is the shuddering wreck on the ground. He grabs at his grimoire nevertheless and begins to chant, but the words, words of a magical language of his own imagining scribbled in a maniacal shorthand ring hollow, and the silence continues unabated. 
He turns and shrugs at some or something, but if there is something there, you do not see it. That dude was messing with the dryad or something. Do, uh, do, do again, steel collar. See a group of adventurers surrounded by a crowd of attacking Zorips. Zorips. This man is with them, seemingly unconcerned by the battle, even detached from it as he stands in the middle of his comrades, chanting, his expression bordering on elation. His voice is powerful and deep, booming out across the combatants as a rich counterpoint to the chaos of the fighting. With every phrase, the battlefield changes. His allies glow with a pulsing blue light, freezing the Zorups that surround them. A blazing pyre erupts from the ground, cutting and burning the creatures, and sending them scattering. One of the fallen Zorups suddenly explodes as three giant grubs crawl from its corpse and attack the remaining enemies. Holy shit, I want that spell. The man continues to chant, thoroughly enthralled in the joy of the moment. Finally, the creatures have been reduced to one. His allies stand back as the man approaches it, still chanting. He removes his hammer and swings it at the Zorup. His phrase ends as the hammer connects with its head, punctuating the spell and bringing his song to an end. Uh, some kind of cleric or war priest, possibly. We have our apprentice smithy. Don't tell Tantanu, but I think Dunstan over there in first fires might have the edge on him. That shifty little Orlin better watch himself. If I work a few extra shifts at the end, I can get one of these daggers. Holy shit, all right. The bellows sigh into the furnace and the coals burn brighter still. An account of Tantanu who sails. The pages are nearly empty. All right, so we got a little quest to cool from Tantanu. Gonna run back in here real quick because I did see something that I might purchase. God's keep you. A rope and grappling hook. Just in case we need to scale any walls and Lug Lug does not have the athletics for it. Hello. I think we pretty much cleaned up. As you wish. Yes. Did a little bit of research on this area, and that kid is supposedly supposed to go down into the temple and start a quest, but he's not doing that. Must be another trigger. Sure to give you a lot of areas to leave at. And it shows, uh, obviously it opens up more destinations. Got to just kind of check them all. Ooh, a windmill. Let's 
go check out the windmill. Uh-oh, encounter. We know there's more grain in there, Trembo. We won't settle for scraps while you grow fat on our crops. A muffled shouting emerges from inside the mill. First of you, Junkins, come through that door, get a shot between your eyes. God hear me, Swainer. I'll put you down like a dog. Come away for now, lads, but we'll be back, Trembo. We'll have fair prices. Or well, by the flame, we'll have a reckoning. Uh-oh. Against the grain quest is upon me. These people are pissed. Unfortunately, Lug Lug only knows how to handle things one way. Settler's Arrow. Hmm, so thinking for what we know from so far is, let's go ahead and save. Because of course we need to pick the evil path. If this guy is starving the villagers, uh, obviously that's probably the evil, that's the bad thing to do. So we would side with this guy and let him continue fucking over everyone else. Oh, he's just going to let us walk right in. Okay, cool. Sure. An elven man stands before you. His relatively stocky build suggesting a life of labor. His face is pale and drawn and his eyes wide. Behind him, a younger man and woman exchange worried glances. The miller raises a club as you enter. It shakes violently in his grip. Get back if you value your life! I don't like being threatened! We have that in common, then, Tremble says, raising his chin a little. With all that poison swearing is dripping in the ears, I'm not going to be long before someone decides they'd rather do things the messy way, and I won't let anything happen to my family. Who's swearing now? That dwarf, the one standing out there spreading lies among the villagers. Bastard's been here for decades, and he hasn't gotten any kinder with time. If I had known Trumbull was an elf, I probably wouldn't have cho chosen this particular voice. This is my, uh, retarded, fat, farmer, human voice. The mill hesitates, then lowers the club a fraction. Who are you? Is Swain the rope and foreigners into his little crusade now? My name is Lug Lug. I've only just arrived in the Gilded Vale. Trumbull, sh Trumbull shakes his head. You picked a bad time to come visiting. Gilded Vale's had its shine scraped off. Just a big dung heap now, and Swaino thinks he's king of it. They're all of them mad. What was all that ruckus outside? Where to begin? Swaino's whipped him up into a froth, going on about the grain stores. Claims I've hidden away most of it. All I do with the grain is sell it. I can't create it out of thin air. And I can't hand it out for free. I pay for the farmers for crops they bring in and I sell what comes out of the mill. Most of it goes to the Black Hound on the west side of town for ale. And Swainer and his lot sure don't mind that part. Well, maybe Swainer's the bad guy. You take a look at the fields on the way into town. The crop's blighted. And most of it I'm getting from the farmers. Trumbull gestures to the sacks and containers. It's gone off rotted through. I can't pay type prices for blighted wheat, and I've barely got enough good grain to go around. Swainer's howling after things he has no right to. Maybe I ought to have a talk with Swainer then. The miller all but sags with relief. I'd be grateful if you did. He won't listen to me anymore, but maybe you'll have better luck. Tell them we're all having a hard time of it. And we'll have to make some sacrifices. We'll be in your debt for it, if you can convince them. 
Maybe I'll convince him to come in here and kill you and your family. For being a group of little twats. Ron Stock, check that crate. It's grain. Let's see if we can go find Swainer. Get some more of the story here. It's always two sides to every story. Come on, hound dog. That looks for grabbing. Nanton. This bottle of Son Raid is half empty. The Deerwood Part 2. The Broken Stone War. I gotta see if we have part one. Uh oh. This man and woman appear to have been in deep conversation, working at closing two bulging satchels. They move to embrace until the woman notices your approach and pauses, her smile faltering a little. Welcome. Can we help you? She looks to her companion, brows furrowing with confusion. Do you know this man, Nanton? <coughs> yes, I think we met in Valewood. I warned him about the bear. He inclines his head. Glad to see you've made it. Was there something else you wanted? You seem to be in a hurry. Yes, I imagine so. <laughs> oh, we're packing for a trip, actually. I've been meaning to visit Defiant Spey, and she looks at Nanton. Well, in truth, I think I've had my fill of this town. Nanton reaches to take her hand. It's time for some new scenery, he says. Is there anything you can tell me about the Gilded Vale? Ingrid smiles wryly, only that you'll want to be moving out as soon as you can. You have seen the tree, I imagine, but the rot goes deeper. If you were looking for work, I'd say you'd have a better chance of it elsewhere. We're headed for Defiance Bay ourselves, Nantan adds. Well, that didn't give us much. Looks like they don't care if I steal their book, either. Taking all this shit. You guys don't need it, right? You're leaving. fire godlike here. Gonna be some soul searching. You see a pair of immaculately polished leather boots and an impeccably maintained goatee. Their owner is a slightly hook-nosed man with a wicked grin and narrow eyes. He bobs his feathered hat at nearby merchants as he ambles by, a small piece of parchment held tight in his fist, ink staining his fair fingers. He seems to know most of the merchants in the market, stopping to engage some, nodding at others, and even bartering for minor goods with a select few, always smiling, laughing, and exchanging jebs. He approaches a heavy-set Amua, smile plastered stiff across his face, and jokes about the weather. She jokes back subtly palming him several gold coins. When he walks away, the paper in his hand is gone, and the smile on his face far more genuine. He tips his cap at her, winking, and trundles off with a new spring in his step. He is an information gatherer. Doran Chamberlain. You see a large crowd gathered in the middle of a courtyard. This man stands in the midst of them, a cloak pulled over his head, holding it closed around his neck. The crowd is congregated around a platform, and they all watch transfixed as a man is led to the platform flanked by two city's guardmen. 
The man is shackled head and foot, but carries himself as a nobleman, not deigning to even glance at the crowd. The cloaked man pulls his cover closer around his face and turns to leave, hunching over to avoid being seen. A cry on the platform unrolls a parchment and begins to read, but the man pays no attention, intent on getting away from the courtyard. The crier's voice grows louder and more intense. As he reads, a voice from the crowd starts to puncture his sentences. The jeers and shouts grow more frequent, and with each one the cloaked man flinches, and his shoulders droop. He breaks from the crowd, coming to the edge of the courtyard as the crier reaches the end of his proclamation. The crowd grows silent again, save for the occasional shout. The man turns back to look at the platform, seeing his father kneeling before the block, neck exposed. What is this, Game of Thrones? The executioner moves into position, lifting his axe to strike. The man turns suddenly, unable to watch. There's a wet thunk, and the crowd breaks into cheers and applause. He leans against the wall, regaining his composure, then straightens up. With obvious resolve, he strides off, away from the crowd and his legacy. What I read about the fire godlike is that they're kind of revered in many places, so who knows? Everyone uh, is disliked somewhere. Keep your distance. I don't want any trouble. We'll just steal your springberry then. Gold Rot Chew, a staple of Deerwood Wooden Countryside. Gold Rot Chew is a favorite of farmers who swear by the minor boost in energy it provides. Those who use it often find that they feel sluggish when they stop. The chew is made from the root of a golden celery plant. Plus three might for 600 seconds, some extra move speed. Perception kind of takes a drop, and then we crash. This is my book, bitch! Bring them down! You're not gonna stop team reading Rainbow! Alright, maybe we won't steal the book. We can read it right out of the out of the drawer, actually. It's my book, man. We've only been able to read two books because we don't have the other parts. We still need we need to find part one of the Deerwood Broken Stone War, which has got to be in here somewhere. And we have the development of the Crucible. Of course. Kara Elof. You see a crowded marketplace. Vendors stall, lining the road, the proprietor's voices calling out to passerbys to come sample their wares. This woman wanders through the throngs, strolling hand in hand with another woman. They peruse the vendor's goods, tarrying at the book merchant with a number of old and beautiful tomes, chatting with one another about what they see. One will pick up a book and show it to the other, who will take it, comment on it, and place it back on the shelf. Then the first will snatch up the book again and quickly pay the merchant before the other can snatch it back. They walk away from the market weighed down by packs filled with books, still hand in hand, standing close, comfortable with, familiar with each other. That's why she got pissed at me for stealing the book. She's a book thief. As they pass down a somewhat deserted street, an object suddenly hits this woman in the chesticle and bounces off. Rolling away toward one of the buildings, the woman stops, looked at the object, it's an apple, and then back up at the person who threw it. There's nothing special about him aside from the angry look on his face and the two other apples he holds. Before either woman can move, the man draws back and throws another one at them, this time hitting the second woman in the forehead. He yells at them something derisive and hateful, something about a legacy and about responsibilities. The woman raises her hand to her head and wipes the juice and bits of fruit from her face and stares the man down defiantly. The first woman squeezes her hand and puts the other on her companion's shoulder, attempting to calm her down. The other woman pulls a book from her pack 
and holds it before her, muttering under her breath. She pulls her hand free and waves it above the book, an aura forming around her. The first woman is still trying to calm her down, but all she says goes unheard. The man uncaring for the events happening in front of him draws back and throws the last apple. As it arcs through the air toward them, the second woman brings up her hand and points at the apple. A glowing orb of energy flies from her hand and strikes the apple, causing it to explode, raining bits of apple down on the road and buildings around them. The man's face changes, anger joined by fear, looking like he's trying to decide if running or attacking is the better course of action. The second woman has started chanting again, her hand glowing, her eyes narrowing. This woman steps in front of her, placing herself between her love and their attacker. Ooh, scissors. She touches her face, gently stroking it while whispering calming words. A kiss. The woman's countenance changes. She calms her eyes, softening her lips, regaining the lost smile. The first woman smiles again as well and kisses the other. With that scum! The man behind them says, and the two women turn to face him, staring him down defiantly. They join hands and begin walking again, moving past him without so much as a sideways glance. Imagine a world where people are racist against your occupation, and not your ethnicity, and not your sexual orientation. This is Edlin Prielston. This might be the girlfriend. You see a key turn gently, steady, and hear a ghostly click as the door swings inward. Two figures slip in, locking the door behind them, and begin their prowl. Their hunt is efficient, and it takes them little time to acquire a sizable collection of documents and oddly shaped velvet pouches. Quick hands fill pockets, rucksacks, and bags. The door opens downstairs, and everything freezes. Footsteps, a tired giggle. The thieves are all white eyes, a short breath as they empty their pockets of all but the necess necessities. Anything noisy, hurriedly replaced. Silence from downstairs, the tentative steps up the staircase. A voice calls out. One thief creeps forward, the other gesticulating wildly for him to return. He continues forward, crouching by the banister. He sees a gaudy shoe and shoves. The woman falls with a cut-off scream, rolling lifelessly to the floor below. Swearing, the second thief grabs her brother and they make their escape, collecting whatever of value they can on the way out. A house full of thieves. So I can read the book, but I can't take it. So we're gonna have to just find part one first. Because reading them out of order is stupid. I think I've done a pretty solid rotation of the town. Offers house. I think we haven't gone to Offers. I'm not actually able to write on the map, am I? I mean, you couldn't on the old school ones, but it would have been nice to drop a pen or something. see a small group of people gathered around the ruins of a house. The destruction continues out from the single dwelling to the entire village. Not a single building still stands. Rubble is scattered everywhere. One of the men in the group leans over something in the debris. It is this man, younger, barely more than a boy. The man reaches out and shakes the boy by the shoulder. The boy makes no sound and doesn't respond to the man's disturbance. The man looks up at the other members of the group and shrugs, standing to rejoin his friends. The boy suddenly sits up, eyes wide. He scrabbles backward away from the group, looking around in horror. The group moves toward him in unison, eliciting a yelp from the boy who tries to move further away. A woman in the group puts out her hand, stopping the rest. 
She turns to them reproachfully, motions for them to stay, and then looks at the boy on the ground, who is trying to push himself through what remains of a wall. He seems unaware he has even stopped. The woman slowly moves toward the boy, hands out, speaking in low, calming tones. For a time, the boy doesn't even hear. He just closes his eyes and braces himself against the wall, expecting violence. Eventually, the woman's words work through the fear, and he hears her. He opens his tear-filled eyes and stares at her. She holds out a hand to him. He looks at it, seeming confused by the offer, then hesitantly reaches out. She takes his hand in hers and leans down to help him stand. So this guy's village was uh, eradicated by some roving bandits, and obviously he was taken in. What is it? Zlox the Usurper. This could be the guy that led the assault on his village. You see a lone man standing in a field. He looks around, surveying the crops. Occasionally he bends to examine a leaf up close. He's intent on what he is doing, completely absorbed in his work. This man approaches him from behind. He moves slowly, but does nothing to mask his approach. In his hand he holds a large sword. There appears to be no malice or hatred in the man's demeanor. He almost seems pleased. The first man hears his approach and stands, turning away from the plant he was expecting. His face breaks into a smile as he opens his arms to welcome the approaching man. The smile freezes into a grimace as the second man thrusts the sword through his stomach, its blade now protruding from his back. His arms slowly fall to his side and blood starts to drip from the sword onto the plants below the men. As the first man crumbles to his knees, the second pulls the sword out, a tear slowly falling down the cheek of his still smiling face. We've got some uh, rugged fucking characters in this town. With a lot of shit on their shoulders. Offra, okay, yeah, we talked to Offra already. Where did you say Anslog's compass is again? Oh, it's south of here, past the wild. Speak to Renga. That's right. The warned or oh, travel that's clever. See, there's an etched illustration of a vast... Oh, yeah, Finn Leviathan. Do you have book number one? Searching all over for it. God damn it, just milk and sugar. A lot of dialogue in these couple videos, but that's going to happen when you get into town and there's all these people and stuff. Hopefully everyone is enjoying the LP. I'm sure we're going to see some action soon. I bet they have better gold rot chew in the city. I'm not sure where uh, Swainer or whatever went off to. He doesn't seem to have a home here. Road west. Okay. North and east. Fair enough. Maybe they're staying at the inn. I can't remember all these damn people. The windows are clouded with the haze of accumulated smoke and cooking grease. Hail Traveler. Don't know who you are and don't much care. Keep walking. We're not here to chat with foreigners. They lost Nero's eyes. Careful. Looks like they're cut from the same cloth as those rowdies who attacked me. He wrinkles his nose. Smells like it, too. I saw you outside of the mill. What was that about? Well, someone fancies themselves a medal, eh? What's that about? It's about Trumbull thinking he's king of the town on account he's got the mill to his name. 
The dwarf's jowls quiver with rage. It's about him barely giving us anything for the wheat we bring him, and then cutting our purses when we need to buy grain. It's about farmers going hungry while some bastard gets rich off their crops. That's what it's fucking about. Now shove off. Tremble says you've been threatening his family. Oh, I bet he has. All nobility that Tremble. Two big, strong kids, Pyrrha's soul and all the gilded veil. Coward sending out messengers to handle his business. Well, you can tell him. Go and tell him we haven't had a solid meal in days on account of him. And we can't afford a good drink on account of him. But we won't be bullied by some foreigner on account of him. You're a drunken menace and I'm putting you down. This is a bit of a... A torn situation trying to pick the evil path. Because on one hand you have these guys that are trying to bully the guy. And his business. Uh, you know. Supply and demand. It is what it is. And any... In any society. On the other hand, you have uh, the guy, you know, kind of screwing over everybody and people aren't eating as well because of him. So that's a bit of, you know, you could easily argue both sides of this. However, let's see what happens here because this is my first option to be aggressive and use my awesome might. We're going to haul Swainer up out of his chair. If you want to fight with Chumple, let's make it a fair one. Hey, hold on there. Swainer raises his hands defensively, eyes big. No need to get nasty. We won't go near the miller. Blazes, we haven't done a thing to him. We're all just hungry is all. He looks at... And looks like it isn't changing. You want to side with that rotten bastard, you go right ahead. You and this whole fucking town. Come to gloat. Let's see. Maybe I can think of something even more evil. That will give us a reputation boost. Of course. The bad thing is, is that I've looked into this because obviously when there's a choice like this, I'm going to research Hail the path, well the, uh, the perks and the, the negatives. If we do this the complete evil way and murder the family in the mill, we are going to end up paying more money here at the inn. Which honestly doesn't look like a bad thing. I'm going to take a hit in the name of evil. Good day to you. So we'll talk to him. He's obviously upset. Maybe I can talk to him for you. You think you're going to get through to him when we have it? The man's thick as a peat bog. I hear he's got his soul red. Found his kin used to grow sunry trees for their Adarian lords. Up until they figured out their side was losing. Explains why his knees still ache to bend to whatever lord or lady crosses the road. He'll be holed up in that mill for days, the coward. The dwarf eyes you considerably. And here, if you want to give it a shot, then good luck. We'll owe you one if you manage it. Alright, I did some parlaying with Mr. Satan. Of course, whom this LP is dedicated to, and wifey Satan. Let's not forget her. We decided that we're going to stick to mercenary lug lug. Stay mercenaries. More of a neutral evil let's play as opposed to a chaotic evil slaughter everything. Because I think there's going to be a better turnout. And I think we'll uh, we'll see more quests and stuff if we don't slaughter everybody in sight. So I'm going to go ahead and God's just stick key. with my original. Greetings.
Gods keep you. All right, so by doing this decision, the town will be con will continue to get screwed with high prices forever. And it's this decision that is going to get us the most money out of all the decisions. Which Lug Lug Mercenary Lug Lug is okay with. So much thought process. Hail and well night. I spoke to Swainer. And what did he say? I convinced him to leave you and your family in peace. Why, that's really, that's great news. I wasn't sure you'd get through to him. They're out of their minds with drink half the time. I owe you a great debt. Here, he pulls a coin purse from his hip and pushes it towards you. Today's earn is to show my appreciation. And you can be sure I'll let everyone know what you've done for me. That's really all you can afford after I saved your family? Oh, no, no, of course, that's fair. Here, I saved some coin just in case we... Well, here it is anyway. We don't need it now. Now we stand a chance of getting through this year. Tremble smiles broadly. All thanks to you. Safe travels, friend. All right, so we got some extra coinage out of it. The town is still in a poo-poo state. I'm glad he convinced them. Last thing we need is our grain stores burned down by a drunk. Thank you. You're giving us a chance to turn things around. Giving you a chance to screw people over? You better stick to it! Don't worry, at the very end of the game, when all is said and done, I'm going to go to each town and slaughter everybody. <laughs> It'll be a bonus video. Lug Lug slaughters the entire world. I think I'm about ready to go into this tomb, but I still don't get why this kid won't go in there. I also think we're out of time, folks, so I would like to say thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. We'll probably descend into this tomb in the next video and check that out. And, uh, yeah, get proper revenge on a bear, possibly. Thanks for watching.